Hi everyone, I'm Kim, the Content Marketing Specialist for Covetris. Today our guest is Danny Chambers, or you may know him as Danny the Vet in the UK. Have you ever heard about the emotional or critical paradox? This enlightening conversation dives into the paradox of empathy and how that emotion is why you got into the industry in the first place. Of course, you care about the animals, but the paradox is that you can almost care too much in a sacrificial way and not in a compromising way. Then you end up overworked, burned out and have compassion fatigue. As we all know, mental health is a big thing. Luckily for us, Danny is a senior vet with decades of experience, a local MP candidate, and he has campaigned on various aspects of mental health and animal welfare. He is also a trustee of Vet Life, which is a mental health charity in the UK, and he talks to us today about how Vet Life can help you. He also talks about many interesting points, including how to deal with mistakes and better ways to think about it and approach stress. Hi Danny, welcome to Pause, Rewind and Play, our podcast. And we are so delighted to have you because you are a very senior vet. And um, I guess to, to round off, we have, you've just been selected as a candidate for Lib Dems MP because you clearly are passionate about activism and politics and I guess three of the main things that you care about are climate change, animal welfare and mental health. Um, you, you know, you have experience in small animal practice, mixed practice, equine practice and I guess you've been around the world. So do you want to tell me more of who you are, how you got into the veterinary industry and why? Yes, well, thanks for having me on this podcast because I'd, I'd love any chance to talk about the mental health within the veterinary profession and specifically vet life, which is you know, a charity I'm a trustee of and um, it's very close to my heart. And certainly it's one of those charities that I think many of the veterinary profession really feel sort of belongs to them. You know, it's, it's, a, it's almost like a community owned charity um because you know, we struggle with quite severely with mental health challenges within the profession but you're right yeah, I'm, a, I'm an rcvs counselor and uh, i'm a candidate for the liberal democrats the next general election and um th- these are you know one of my main reasons for getting involved in these organizations is because i passionately care about mental health mental health delivery funding you know and, and that mental health should be given the same sort of equivalence as physical health when it comes to sort of delivery and funding and urgency and, and priority and it's very much Absolutely. neglected throughout the country at the moment yeah so with that as a trustee of vet life um and you have, you've obviously got a lot of credentials to your name and a wealth of experience around everything. Um, but as a trustee of that life, can you just tell our listeners exactly who they are and what they can offer to people? Yes, so Vet Life is the charity that takes that, that supports the mental health of the UK veterinary profession. And so that is our role. If, if you're involved in the veterinary profession in any way, as a vet, a student, as a, as a veterinary nurse, um, or anyone who works within a veterinary practice, then we will support your mental health. And one of the key ways we do that is that we have a 24 hour helpline that is available for you to contact either by phone or via sort of email through the website. It's completely anonymous, completely confidential, and you get trained volunteers who also work in veterinary practice. So they understand the pressures and stresses and mm. sort of challenges that you, that you may be sort of feeling. So if, you, if people are feeling sort of stressed or, or low or lonely, um, which is a big problem actually when people are working many hours and don't get time to socialize and meet friends, depending where they're living in the country as well. Um, or if you just had a really bad day, or if you're even feeling you know, at, at a crisis point where you're feeling 
severely depressed and you, and you need to reach out for help there will be someone there 24 hours a day so that, that helplines are probably the best known thing that we we deliver as a charity and um, there are other things that we do as a charity there's the the health support so if you if you need um sort of urgent referral you know privately to get medical help for mental health issues we can arrange that for you and there's a mm-hmm. financial support as well for um, people who are feeling um, that if, for various reasons um, that there's, there's quite a few criteria they have to meet. But if you if you need financial support, um, which will make a big difference to your mental health, then there are ways we can deliver that as well. So yeah, so in a nutshell, it's Vet Life is the charity that um, looks after the mental health of the veterans profession. Yeah, and on the points of stress or the reasons why people get stressed, some are obviously quite obvious. So Obviously, in vet life, there's burnout, there's compassion fatigue, there's being overworked. The pandemic has exacerbated things. There's so much going on, but are there any sort of not so obvious uh, factors that play a part in this or things that maybe aren't spoken about enough? Because I know you posted on social media and on LinkedIn about, for example, the critical paradox. So it's where people are maybe learning from their mistakes. But if you're a scientist or if you're a vet, you make a mistake, it could potentially be quite catastrophic. Um, It's very different to, say, someone working in a retail store or in an office and they make a mistake. So there's a lot of criticism. There's a lot of comparison. How do people navigate? Well, what firstly, what are the stress factors that we don't know about? And B, how do people navigate that? Well, the ones you mentioned there are really interesting, actually. And they're, you know, they're not unique only to the veterinary profession, but there are a lot of areas of work where you don't experience them. You're right about what we call the critical paradox, the emotional paradox. But just to take a step back, you know, in veterinary practice, you've got the same pressures and stresses as you would with, with many jobs. So you know, we're yeah. really busy. Um, we're, we've got a shortage of vets at the moment. There's been an increase in pet ownership. Demand, um, yeah. There's more work for fewer vets, having to work longer hours. And obviously the you know, the type of people we're dealing with quite often have, have got a sick animal. They're feeling very stressed. And so you've got to deal with the emotional um, or the emotions of the owner as well as treating the animal. And um, and another sort of thing that vets really struggle with is that, you know, there's no NHS for animals. You know, you have to charge for what you do to have a viable business and to make a living. Some people yeah. can't afford that. So, you know, you end up euthanizing animals that maybe could have been treated, which some vets really struggle with. And obviously yeah. some owners are very good about it and some owners get very angry with you personally saying that you know, you're just money grabbing, that kind of thing, which is which is really, you know, can, can really can really hurt when you're doing your best, you know. And I think um, that those stresses sort of added on with, um, you know, sort of, you know, sometimes you graduate from university, you might end up working sort of in the middle of nowhere where you're not living with your friends anymore and you're exhausted on your, if you're working one or two nights a week and working some weekends on call, when you finally get a weekend off, you just want to sleep. So you end up becoming a bit antisocial, not getting time to exercise, get outside, do your hobbies, and all the things that are good for your general sort of mental health. So that, that, that all adds up to a situation where some people, you know, really struggle. But on top of that, the two things that, you, that you've that you mentioned, uh, um, it, it's, it's really difficult when you've got to, you know, what we call the, the emotional paradox, where to be a good vet, you have to really care about your patients, obviously, and you have to be a very empathetic person. And often empathetic people are the sort of people who go into caring roles that veterinary is one of them you know obviously there's medicine and different types of carers and different types of nursing you know there's a whole load of health provisions and and then carers that people that attract a certain type of person and that can although that's a huge attribute because if you didn't care you wouldn't be doing a very good job if you care almost too much or you if you get almost too deeply involved with every single case and you're and you're really feeling you know, the, the same emotions as the owner does every time you have to euthanize an animal or when something dies, um, and you're doing that several times a day, that can be emotionally draining. 
and it's what we call a very very tricky balance you're right it's a really tricky balance so you Mm. you need to be sort of caring and empathetic enough to ensure that you do a good job and you recognize you know that the the suffering of the owner and the animal and to reflect that back to them and but you you, you've got to have the ability to sort of compartmentalize it rationalize it you know ideally go home and not spend the whole evening mulling over it you know like like the owner will be when you've just done a euthanasia and then the other thing you mentioned is what we call the critical paradox is you know as as scientists and as as medics and you know i'm also a trustee of an evidence-based medicine charity it's called rcvs knowledge you know a big part of evidence-based medicine and improving medicine and improving yourself actually as a clinician is recognizing your mistakes and learning from them but ideally you want to learn from other people's mistakes as well because we don't all make them ourselves so if i make a mistake the best thing I can do is let everyone know so that they can learn from it. But it's a tough thing to do, to admit that you've made mistakes. Mm. Animals might have died as a result of that. You feel hugely guilty because of it. So it might be easier to say, well, it would have happened anyway. You know, be, be fairly un- ref- self-reflecting as a, as a coping mechanism. But also you've got to say, you know, telling your friends and colleagues or owners that you made a mistake, you know, it can be both sort of embarrassing or it can even cause quite a lot of aggravation you know if it's not done in the right way you know some owners will understandably if they've lost an animal and you say well it's because I made a mistake they, they might get very angry with you they're feeling very emotional so I think those sort of the emotional paradox and this sort of critical paradox where you're recognizing mistakes are, are two things that a lot of vets really really struggle with and if you're already working long hours and you're short-staffed and you're performing euthanasias and you're you know I think um that can really work into a perfect storm of causing mental health issues yeah so to that point what what can we what can vets do to navigate that because I know that we charities and other people will have the good intention of advising or trying to impart the wisdom of you know Mm. replenish your own cup fill up your own cup again re-energize get some rest get some more sleep take a break have a holiday say no to that extra consult um you know try push back Mm. but you know i get this huge sense to this huge feeling where vets really feel like they can't do that because like you say the global shortage of vets there's not enough time how can they create or make time for themselves? Yeah, I mean, that is, you're exactly right, where people feeling stressed is often because they feel like the situation is out of their control. And when things are going wrong, like if genuinely, if you're making actual mistakes or if you're just really busy and exhausted and feel like you're not delivering the service that the patients or owners deserve, that's normally not your fault. It's normally a uh, sort of the system you're working within, the organisation that you're working in is setting you up to work in a situation where you can't deliver the care that's necessary. So I would say there's a subtle difference between pressure and stress. So if, um, you know, pressure can really help you perform like you know if you're going to play some sort of sporting event or a rugby match or a race and you get that that pressure the adrenaline rush you know um it it makes you perform better than you would have done without being in that situation and it can be the same you know in a clinical setting you get like an emergency come in and everyone works as a team there might be a bit of adrenaline going but everyone knows what they're doing you know you have to step up to the plate and you know and and do a really good job to save a life and that pressure can make you do things you wouldn't have done otherwise. And that's healthy. But where it turns into stress is when there's a huge amount of pressure without the right sort of support in an environment to, to meet that challenge. So, for example, if you are not given the right clinical support by a mentor, if you're a new graduate and you're expected to deal with emergencies with no one else in the building having performing emergency procedures that you've never even seen done before that is the difference between pressure where you feel supported and you're going to do a good job but even if you're going out of your comfort zone to suddenly feeling stressed like I just don't know what I'm doing and if it goes wrong I've got no help and that's a very um that's a very different situation and so like when you've got practices that are you know when vets are working really long hours 
no one minds occasionally. You know, if it's a busy day, you get a few unexpected emergencies, you're meant to finish at six, but, you know, sometimes you have to stay for an extra hour or two just because everything went wrong that day. And that's the team pulling together. And it can actually be really fulfilling and you feel like part of a team and you feel like that you've done a really good job. Of course. But if you're in a situation where you're meant to finish at six every day and you never get out of there before eight o'clock ever, because that's just the way the practice runs. So you're basically working two extra hours unpaid at the end of the day regularly. That is stress. You know, that's not pressure, that's stress. And that's not your fault. It's the organisation that you're working within. And I think what is what we can do like from a, from an RCVS point of view, which I hope will make a big difference, is that we've brought in this graduate development program so that if you take on a new graduate, you'll have someone within the practice who's trained to mentor the new graduate so that they feel that they're supported and they're less likely to feel that sort of stress and, and emotional stress and, and physical stress and feel like they, that they're not good at the job because they even if they're dealing with pressure, they feel supported to do a good job. And I think I'm hoping that will make a big difference, but also organisations are recognising that big veterinary practices, you know, especially corporate as well, are recognising that you need to look after your vets if they're all working all hours, all the time, continually. Tight, they're going to leave. They're going to burn out. They're going to be stressed. They're going to get mental health issues. And one really good example of it is I work for a company called Equicool, which is part of CVS, and we do out of hours for horses. So I do a week on, week off, I do a week of nights plus a weekend. And um, and it means that the vets who are working during the day, they get to finish at six o'clock and go home. And they don't have to then go and do loads of emergencies because it's traditional in equine practice that if you finish at six o'clock, but you're also the closest one to an emergency, and it might even be an hour away from you, you still go have to do it. And then you don't get home till nine o'clock. Um, and it also means as, as the person who's just done a whole night on call, maybe two nights in a row, which often happens, you then don't have to do a completely normal day's work the following day, you know, maybe not having had much sleep and, and, and just uh, and feeling exhausted. So I get to do the exciting emergency stuff, which I love, but I yeah. don't have to work in the day as well. So I can do other things that interest me, like speaking to you now, like I'm, I'm working this week, I was on call last night, I'm on call tonight, I've got today off, so I can do things like this without having to take a day's holiday or block out the diary and, you know, feel like you're, you're causing a load of hassle for the practice. Yeah. Um, and the other vets this week all get to go home at six o'clock and not have to worry about out of hours and not be working during the day, having been up all night. So th- these kind of interventions, I think, are, are, are this creative way of thinking um, and trying new ways of working are more important now than have ever been before to help support people. Yeah, they're absolutely completely innovative solutions because, like you say, it's about the infrastructure, the environment new programs that can be trialed and tested and hopefully at the end proven to work and you know I was always curious it it was a great question to ask you because you're an individual that is doing so much you're on so many councils boards institutions writing papers doing interviews and you're juggling a lot of balls so but yet somehow you can demonstrate that you're able to sort of balance that in a healthy way through programs like what RCBS is doing. And then distinguishing, the, what I'm hearing is distinguishing the difference between sort of healthy pressure and understanding what stress looks like, but also not minimizing that if an individual feels any level of stress, no matter how minor it feels, give that life a call. Yeah, that's the message, right? Everybody should be there to support each other, no matter how minor or major. Yes, that's exactly right. I mean, what I would say as well is that there's a lot of support we can give each other. You know, if yes. you, and it's really good to, I mean, there's loads of really good information on the Vet Life website, and just about recognizing stress in colleagues and, you know, or having the kind of culture or team where you feel that you can talk to someone else in your team if you need to. Um, or another family member. I mean, vet life is there. We, we, we urge you to call us, and we don't want people to only call, you know, in crisis point because there's nowhere else to turn. Yeah. If you're feeling lonely, give a chat, and we'll, you know, give a call and have a chat to you and help you. But if you can, if there's other people within your team um, that you can speak to, or your friends who you graduate with, like old housemates from university working in other practices, 
you know, a lot of the time you'll have had a really bad day and you will think you're not very good at your job because you made a mistake or you don't know enough or you feel, that's how you feel. You ring them. They'll have had exactly the same thing happen that day. They'll have felt exactly the same way, probably felt too stupid to phone someone else and tell them as well. And then when you realise that everyone feels the same and it's normal, mm. it does make you feel a lot better about it. And one of the big, I run a, um, a big uh, a, a, online Facebook group called Vet Voices, about 15,000 vets and vet nurses in it. And one of the, and then people you know, ask clinical questions and discuss you know, how to deal with difficult situations or ethical problems or you know problematic clients, that kind of thing. And one of the things that I found really interesting was one of the comments was someone said, um, I'm 17 years graduated and I thought I should better do this now. And I thought I should better know everything now. And simply seeing the conversations and questions being asked has made me realise that it is normal not to know everything. It's normal, even at 17 years, to want to discuss cases, even what you might consider to be a straightforward case, you know, and, um, and talk to other people about the things you struggle with. And she said, like, I, was, I was thinking that I wasn't cut out for this after all these years. And just seeing the conversations has made me realise that I'm doing as well as everyone else and it's fine. And that was probably probably the most interesting comment I ever saw made. That because I remember, you know, I'm like twelve years graduated, and you sort of view people you know, when you first graduate, ten years, twenty years. Like, oh, they all know everything. It must be so easy for them. I can't wait till I get to the point where I know everything. And you never get to that point. You know, <laughs> some, no, and, I think and that's it's actually awesome. reassuring. You know, it's not meant to depress you. It, it's fine. It's normal not to know everything. You're not meant. To, you can't possibly know everything. You yeah. know. Um, no, and the philosophy I often turn to is, you know, we're always a student of life. Mm. We're both a student and we're a teacher, always. <laughs> There's always something to learn. Um, so if, you're, if somebody is able to take action for themselves, what about in the scenario where you might be worried for a colleague? So I'm worried about a colleague who seems in dire straits um, is extremely stressed and you're just worried about your state of mind what do you do yeah I mean that's a really common question actually um and there's quite a few different things you can you can do um and the most obvious one and it doesn't always feel easy and it depends a lot on your relationship with that person maybe they're more senior than you maybe more junior than you maybe you haven't been there long maybe they seem very unapproachable but it is you know asking them if they're okay <laughs> um, and it seems painfully obvious but I know from experience it's a difficult thing to ask as well and sometimes the you know the the most um sort of walled up angry looking person who's actually feeling stressed can really open up to someone just showing that level of empathy and I think that's that's really important you know so you know fostering an environment if you're a clinical director or a manager or partner and where you're responsible for a team where people you know feel that they can come to you if they're not okay but that you'll proactively reach out to them if they're not okay and understandably they might not want to speak to you you know about it but making sure they know where they can go to if they want to speak that there is support available I think that's a that's a very big um you know knowing that you know the, the vet life helpline exists and that you can contact by email if you don't want to actually pick up the phone you know we get about two-thirds of the contacts of the vet life helpline actually written rather than by the phone these days so it's obviously a way people prefer to sort of reach out um but also um i think as well just seeing what you can do to to help as well you know if there's a specific cause of them always being stressed like they're on a really bad shift or a late shift or you know sometimes there's certain part, times of the day that are always busy and they're always the one that's dealing with it you know there's there's ways you can rearrange the team so that one person isn't always doing something um that no one else is doing you know so you're sort of sharing the load and people feel you know appreciated and and it's yeah. difficult at the moment with covid but you know the time when people relax is just when they get together you know after work or out of work you know, it doesn't have to be a pub. Not everyone wants to go to a pub, but, you know, that's the classic one. Just yeah. refuse, you know, but, you know, organising. It's a good reminder, out. though. Yeah. yeah, you know, invite them around to your, your house, you know, have a team. You know, it doesn't have to be a big team building formal day, you know, just yeah. I'm, I'm making shepherd's pie tonight. He wants to come, you know, that, that kind yeah. of, 
you know I think it's yeah, just, people just feel happen. cared for you mm-hmm. know and they're more likely to reach out for help aren't they um, but it's recognizing that they're struggling you know there's stuff on the vet life website about how to deal with how to recognize okay. changes in behavior um yeah it's good to know people are struggling yeah because i think it's really important to be acutely aware and and identifying behaviors and patterns and yeah. just how we can all rely on each other and yes that's the crux of it um i think a lot of it as well is just trying to reframe people's thoughts and expectations you know of themselves as well as in just you know to be blunt when you're speaking to people who have just graduated or the finally a vet school and um you know it, it's managing expectations that y- you will make mistakes yeah and things will die throughout your career that happens to absolutely everyone and it's it, there's no benefit to the veterinary profession in you quitting because you made a mistake because you're now the person who's least likely to make that mistake again you will have learned from it um yeah. and 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 you're not abnormal from it and the other thing to remember as well is it's how you measure success as in you know sometimes you will get the diagnosis right the treatment right and the animal will die anyway that's not your fault and you can't go home and cry about that for a week because you've done nothing wrong sometimes you'll get the diagnosis right the treatment right the animal will live and the owner will put in a complaint for some reason Mm-hmm. that's not your fault you know if you see these as a catastrophic failure and start saying i can't do this job i'm not cut out to do this i'm a complete failure cuz someone's complained that you've got completely um unreasonable expectations going into your career and and i think going into the your career knowing that these things will happen and the way i sort of explain to to students is that there are risks of being a vet and you know you might get bitten we will get bitten at some point yeah. <laughs> you will get kicked sometimes and you will get complained against sometimes and you know if you know a vet who's been bitten okay do you don't think they're just a terrible vet you know what what, what why are they even in the profession how are you used to it's just one of those things and equally if someone gets complained against you don't think well they should just quit they're useless it's just one of those things you know and i've been bitten i've been kicked i've been complained yeah. against i'm still here i'm still being offered jobs still here, i'm still yeah. enjoying work <laughs> some i think it's some um, you know and i will get complained against at some point in the rest of my career um, you know and i'm not going to quit over it and 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 actually you know you, you've got to it end up this is when you need to have support from your colleagues and your boss and your clinical directors and the people around you but if someone complains about me either they might have a point and it's normally you know a communication issue like you didn't explain something to them or they they had the wrong end of the stick or they didn't realize you know it's going to cost so much or it's going to you know be a lifelong treatment or whatever you just didn't explain it properly and that so you can learn from that you think well next time I'm going to make you know I'll make sure I explain things differently and I'll give you an example is um is in my first job um we're giving something called procolin which is a paste that you give for dogs with diarrhea that can sort of firm them up a little bit and they give three meal twice a day and the owners came back in about three days later the dog was better and they're like he really hated that stuff and I said did he most of them quite like it you know they're like no no we had to get our neighbors round to help give it to him that's just But that's that's really unusual. No, it turned out they're putting it up the backside, not through the mouth. No, no. <laughs> oh god! Yeah. <laughs> you know, and they were really like, "This is just this is the most stupid thing we've ever seen." Really, you know, they they really thought this is a, a unhelpful treatment. You know, and 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 so you know now they're always right on the label, give by mouth. It seems so obvious, and I always <laughs> give the first one in the consult so yeah. they can see how to do it. You know, and just sometimes, yeah. just sometimes you can laugh about it. Yeah. It's not always. Yeah. And, and that's a funny one. Yeah, you know, I yeah. learned from that. And the other one is just some people are just unreasonable. You know, they've probably <laughs> the bank. They probably go at the car mechanic. Now they're going to go at you. You know, it's them that's angry of the world. You know, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. they're going to ruin your day. You know. I feel like those words though are really critical. Like that education. If a graduate could hear that, or even a senior vet. We need to be reminded mistakes happen often and we just need to share them we need to be mindful we need to learn from them but we are just human at the end of the day yeah. and 
Yeah, get constantly reminded. What you can do to improve, and just for example, we talk about stress, and a lot of it is you know people worry about complaints, and you know it's one of the big things that that students and new graduate vets worry about in particular. Um, but there's so much we can do to control this. Just for example, like I said, you might get kicked, you might get bitten, you might get complained against. That's normal. If you're getting kicked four times a day, you know, maybe have a look at you go on some animal handling skills. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, just so, me all the so time. Like, yeah. maybe, maybe I should use more sedation. Maybe I, you know, I don't even know. Or, you know, if you're getting bitten repeatedly, start using a muzzle or get a nurse to hold it or look at how you're reading, you know, learn to read dog body language and you'll improve that massively. If you were getting complained about, you know, eight times a day, you know, there are communication skills you can go yeah. on. You know, there's, there's things you can do to, to improve your rapport and, and communication skills. It's not something out of your control. Mm. Um, and another thing I, I think is really important, I know we touched on the, it being about the system and organisation you work in. Um, I'll, I'll, I remember, um, I, I, worked, I know you're from Aberdeen, aren't you? and I've worked in Aberdeen yeah. many times uh, covering um, maternity leave. And I, I remember doing a, a whole year, I think it was no, no, 11 months in Aberdeen, once and to my knowledge I didn't get a single client complaint that whole time certainly one, none that I was informed about by anyone and then I went back to another practice um where, where I've worked before as well um I had several years experience at this point and by the end of my first week I'd had six complaints and I was the same vet with the same Ooh. skills doing the same job as I was the week before I yeah. hadn't gone pretty much a year without a single complaint to get six complaints within a week you think what's gone wrong you know and that's partly because of the everything from the owner's expectations how they're managed from when they first make an appointment to pricing structures that just for example um when I was in Aberdeen we had a set rate for you know sedation and teeth rasping and where I was in the in the, in the other place they, um, they, they were trying to undercut sort of local equine dentists and it was something like £30 for a teeth rasp. But if you sedated, it came to £80. And I was like turning up, sedating all these horses, doing the teeth, owners expecting, you know, it's going to be about 30 quid, getting bills for £80. And, and you know, and your diary that gets booked in, you know, places, you know, can you turn up here and castrate a horse at 10 o'clock and then be here for somewhere else at 11 o'clock, which is an hour away. I think you're, you're always going to upset people because you're late. And actually, the, the reasons they were complaining was not because of my clinical skills or because of my ability as a vet. It was because of the environment and the situation that I was working in and the expectations that were managed right from reception you know, to the way the practice pricing structure was, um, was, was, was sort of managed. And the reason I bring it up as an example is that had my first job had been in Aberdeen, I'd be thinking, I'm the best forever. I love this job. Everyone loves me. It's, uh, it's really easy. You know, yeah. there's nothing else I want to do. If my first job had been in, in this other practice and I'd had six complaints at the end of the first week, you'd be like, oh my goodness, like I, I didn't realise it was so hard. I, maybe I should quit. <laughs> maybe, you know. And so what yeah. I want to say is, if you're working in an environment where you know, you're not supported, you're feeling really stressed, you're always working late, Complaints are piling in, even though you're working really hard. You know, no job's worth your mental health. There's a massive shortage of vets. Yeah. Just quit. There are really nice places to work. There are really nice supportive teams. There's people that will really look after you, and they're all desperate for vets. So do not sacrifice your physical and mental health in, no, a, in a job that won't, you, you, that is setting you up to fail, if you see what I mean. You know, yeah, and even if you... I guess the message is that even if you have that bad experience, like you don't have to resign from the profession completely. There yeah. are other options and better options. Better options within clinical yeah. practice. You don't have to quit and you know, um, uh, do you know, go into academia or go into mm. industry or you know, other roles that are very interesting. But you don't have to do them because you think you can't cope as a vet you know if you choose to do them that's very different but you shouldn't feel pushed out of the profession because there will be a practice that works for you and a team yeah. that works for you yeah absolutely and so I, I have a, a couple of last couple of questions for you Danny and that is around so we spoke about this the external support in terms of technology are there any like tools or technology that you find helps you personally or professionally? I think um, for me, when you're involved in a few different uh, sort of organisations and is 
making sure that you've got a diary that syncs with all different organizations you know where you're meant to be every day and it's quite easy to you know book a, a clash where you say you're gonna um, be at one place for one organization and, and then the same place for another one at the same time and so for me it's making sure I'm, I'm I know that I'm yeah in the right place at the sort of right time from a stress point of view um from a health point of view the, the coolest thing I own um because I'm not some fitness freak at all but I've got some Garmin watch which I love it takes my heart rate and it tracks my run <laughs> yeah I just love it you can see what your heart rate is when you're asleep and you know yeah. and for me um I I need I feel so much better when I exercise regularly like I really do and one of the uh, but I'm also really lazy like I feel good having exercised yeah, just having the motivation right? <laughs> it's really hard to get out and do it and one of the things that makes me go and exercise is that if you're on Strava or on the Garmin thing is that you know I'm seeing that there's like a week where you haven't done anything or I haven't done you know whatever you're doing every third day seeing these big gaps is enough to make me go oh, I'll have to do something today because I don't want to see a big gap and so it's a really good motivation and the, probably the biggest thing for me, just enjoying work itself, is um, I, I do some small animal work. I do mainly mainly horses, and that often involves a huge amount of driving. And you can drive, you know, 150 miles a day in these little country roads. You know, spending out more time driving than looking at horses. And for a while, that really got me down. Um, and I discovered like Audible, where you can listen to audio books while you're driving. And I listen to when I'm running as well, actually. And what I've I used to read a lot, especially when I was a kid. And then um, I, I, I love reading. And then I've just, when I graduated, I was working so much. I never really had the time to read. And it's a way I can find that I can read while I'm driving. It's what I would be doing as a hobby, but I'm getting paid at work to do what I would be doing <laughs> like at home as a hobby. And it, and it really, um, that, that made me, now I've got to the point where instead of putting the next call on my sat nav and seeing it's an hour away and going, oh, yeah, a whole hour of driving. Now I'm like, I'll get another chat from my book done. Brilliant. <laughs> so it's yeah, no, my, um, my, 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 you know, the problem's never the problem. The, the problem is how you approach the problem, isn't it? So what, mm. what for me was a problem is now an opportunity to get through books that I love. So, yeah, so I'd say that's probably the biggest piece of technology that's, that's helped me. Yeah, just, just a change in the perception. Yeah. Indeed, audible books are, are awesome, especially in a similar way, you know, office workers, actually, your eyes are so strained. You don't want to read anymore. You can't read. So sometimes it's just better to listen. Yes. Um, you can absorb all the knowledge that way or be transported into a different world. Um, so last question is, obviously, once again, being a trustee of that life, how can we support that life? Well, there's loads of ways. And it's actually really good fun as well so the most obvious ways to support better life is to do uh, get involved in some fundraising activities um and a lot of practices do this together sometimes a sporting challenge like they do a, you know like a, a 10k run together um or, yeah. they, or they organize some sort of um right sort of baking competition and um it, it's and some people are making things where the proceeds go to vet life like uh, scrub caps and um and masks and that kind of thing and recently we did a really good fun. There's three of us trustees, there's Adrian, Paul and myself, organised this uh, sort of trek through Snowdonia. It's five days, about 120 kilometres. And we must have had about 20 odd people come and join us. Mm -hmm. for that. And that was, it was quite challenging, actually. I think I thought I'd find it really easy and I didn't. <laughs> it was really it was <laughs> We're carrying like all that, you know, our gear and everything. But that was really good fun. Like it was, you know, you're outside, you're walking. After the pandemic, we hadn't seen people for ages. You know, we all got together again and um and it and and we raised about ten thousand pounds for vet life. So that, that was really, really good fun. And we'll be doing it again. Okay. Yeah, we'll probably be doing something like the James Harriet way of you know, another another sort of trek if people want to join us. And, but, you know, you can organise your own things for that. Um, another big thing that people don't realise is that you can become a member of VetLife. So um, it's a monthly fee. I can't remember exactly what's off the top of my head. It's something like £4 a month. Um, it's about the price of, you know, a cup of coffee every month. And yeah. the advantage of being a member for us is that we have a predictable and regular income. Um, so it's not, you know, just random 
money coming in from fundraising and then nothing next month, that kind of thing. So it's really useful when you're delivering services to know how much you got coming in every month. The advantage to you is that you can, if you wanted to stand as a trustee and get involved in the running of Vet Life that like we do, you have to be a member. So that so it's worth joining if you're interested in, in becoming a trustee, which is a very fulfilling role, which I really enjoy and I'd urge anyone to consider it. Um, but also as a member, you get to vote for who's going to be a trustee. Um, so if you don't want to stand yourself, but you want to have a say in who's running Vet Life, um, you know, every year there's sort of elections with trustees to, to, to get elected. So you'll have a say in that. And also you can attend, you know, the, the AGMs and meetings and, and that kind of thing. So that's, that I think I'd urge people to become a, a member of Vet Life if they, if they want to. Um, and then things like, um, you know, it, it, it might sound little, but sharing our social media posts really helps the reach. You know, yeah. you might share something that one of your friends will see and just at the right time, you know, and, and they know there's someone out there helping them. And equally, you can get a lot of vet life sort of resources, um, you know, like stickers that you can put around your practice with the phone number and the contact details if, if people need it as well. Um, I think that's probably one of the, the best things you can you can do to, to, to help vet life is get, you know, get involved promoting our services however way, however you want to do that. Um, yeah, I'm also, sure. you, know, you said about people being, you know, um, how do you approach your colleague? You know, if they don't want to talk to you, you know, have the vet life number in your phone, and you've got it there. You can give it to them. You know, what's idea. happened to them? Something yeah. like that. You know, just so they've got it. You know, you don't even have to have a big conversation with them, but just, you know, just so they know there's 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 a group of people out there you know, who care about them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm told that in some research, for example, the helpline stickers or any sign or indication or a poster whatever it may be people are more likely to take action before they reach crisis point if they see a sign or if they see a sticker so it does like you said they they may seem small but it does have a huge powerful effect and also the big one which i haven't said um is you know you can volunteer to be on the help the vet line helpline so it's staffed by about 80 odd people volunteers you it's, it's 24 hours a day so the more people we have to help cover the shifts you know the fewer shifts each individual has to do so we'd love to have a bigger team but you know 80 people's quite a lot um but you get a lot of training you know you're not just given a phone and have to um you know deal with people who are struggling you get really good quality mental health training and how you how you respond to these calls and how you signpost people for help and you also get support you know, when you're on a shift as well, there's other people you can contact if you if there's something you don't know how to deal with. But you know, the training is quite um, uh, rigorous. You know, so yeah. it's definitely worth doing. So if you're interested in helping from that point of view, we've got vets, we've got vet nurses, um, we've got, yeah, you know, people who have been a practice manager, that kind of thing. You know, who are all in the volunteer team. So that's something if you you know if you really want to be involved. Um, and you, you know, rather than doing sort of fundraising and running and baking that kind of thing, it's it's a way of being right in the front end of it. You know, and mm-hmm. the volunteers are amazing. You know, we wouldn't have the service without them. So, you know, that's something. Yeah, absolutely, do. yeah. Well, Danny, I want to thank you for your time on this podcast and giving solid advice. I know that our audience and our listeners will really appreciate your expertise your voice in being the bridge between the veterinary profession and RCBS and now being elected as a Lib Dem candidate as MP to stand in the UK House of Commons. You know, your activism really shows, your passion shows. Uh, yeah, I, I do think that our listeners will find this invaluable. So thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you for taking interest. We really appreciate it when any organisation or person you know wants to talk to us about this there's quite a few of us trustees who will happily um, come on and, and talk about mental health and the veterinary profession and, and things we can do you know to help each other um, yeah yeah and everything that we've mentioned um obviously in the interview and the podcast we'll put all the resources and links in our show notes so thank you, thank you once again Danny. i guess the biggest thing i'd say to finish is that you know you, you can't look after animals if you don't look after yourself might seem obvious yeah. but you know, people don't. So you, you've got to be the number one priority, even if you, if, if you, if your whole ambition is to care for animals and offer a good service, you, you can't do it if you're running on empty. So. Yeah.
Yeah, take care of yourself, folks. Everyone approaches stress and burnout differently. Of course, there's nuances in how we deal with things, but I found that the conversation with Danny meant that we can further understand things like the difference between healthy pressure and stress and what it means to have a supportive infrastructure that can help you or can hinder you if it's not supportive. The key message being that you do need to find your right tribe. Make sure that the clinic looks after you in every way possible. You know, do they have the right tools in place? Are there open and inclusive policies? Do they ensure there is a transparent environment where you can talk about issues or improving things? Are there colleagues that you can lean on? As a trustee of VetLife, Danny shows and tells us how VetLife can help you. And as he said in the episode, they are trained volunteers, are unbiased, anonymous, and it's very confidential. All the information you need are linked in the show notes. And by all means, no matter how small you may feel or think an issue is, you should definitely reach out to VetLife or any helpline as and when you need to. Good luck, folks.